Hello, I'm Chuck Wolf, Chief Executive for Charles J. Wolf Associates, LLC. As a motivational speaker and a leadership consultant and executive coach and trainer, I often work with very successful people in their companies. Since many can't afford a professional, I volunteer to host a radio talk show called The Emotion Roadmap, Take the Wheel and Control How You Feel, on a nonprofit community radio station in Bridgeport, Connecticut, WPKN. My reason for doing the show is to share with as many people as possible this wonderful process for helping people manage their own emotions and their relationships with others. My goal is for everyone listening to learn to use the Emotion Roadmap to make life better. As you listen to me, help others, I hope you are also learning. As a Simsbury resident, I'm delighted to be able to make the show available through Simsbury TV. To learn more, go to my website www.emotionroadmap.com. Thank you for listening and watching. And this is Chuck Wolf. You're listening to the Emotion Roadmap. Take the wheel and control how you feel. Uh, great to be back here with you. And it's uh, today's show, I want to talk about something that I think you'll find really interesting. The idea of being a coach is something that we all do in, in our own ways. We do it when we are talking to our children and we're trying to influence them to be behave in a certain manner. We do it when we're talking to a colleague and we're involved with something that you might call peer coaching, where you're on an equal level, but you're, you're actually trying to help somebody to learn how to do something or to change a behavior or to deal with a conflict or a difficult um, situation that they're facing. What do we mean when we say the word coach? It's an important conversation for me because uh, pleased to report that uh, Duquesne University out of Pittsburgh went uh, searching around the world for authors for a professional desk reference for coaches. And they picked uh, a number of authors that they felt had something to say. And they asked me if I would write a chapter on the role of emotions in coaching. The role of emotions in coaching. So we may not think of ourselves formally as a coach. When you think about formal coaches, most people, or at least many people, think of one of two things, I believe. One is the sports world, where you have a coach um, like um, Bill Belichick uh, for the Patriots. You've heard me talk about them. <laughs> you probably don't want to hear me talk more about them. Uh, and I'm not going to talk about the Patriots today, but I am going to talk about the Celtics, the Boston Celtics. Uh, those of you who get to see this uh, radio show on um, either YouTube or uh, up in Simsbury, where I live, on community television, um, this is the day after um, an all-star performance by Isaiah Thomas. And I'm going to talk about that, uh, not just because of the, the, the victory that they had over the Washington team, but, but because of the emotional circumstances surrounding one of their key players, Isaiah Thomas. And I imagine some of you will know about this, but many of you will not, and I'll explain it in a bit. But so one, one way we think about coaches is this idea of a formal coach. A formal coach is somebody that's got the title. We also have formal coaches in our business world and nonprofit as well as profit where we have people who are hired to come in and coach other individuals. You might be coaching somebody who's very young, who's uh, got some potential and something, someone that the organization wants to invest in and keep, but perhaps they have an issue that is keeping them from getting along with some of their peers and supervisors, and it's a real toss-up about whether you let them go and start again with somebody new. And while sometimes people frustrate you and you feel like, boy, I wish, we, I wish you were different somehow, and you want to fix them, um, and you think, well, maybe it's just easier if I start over. But starting over involves trying to find a new person, training that new person, and hoping that new person doesn't have their own different and difficult issues, which you're not always going to find. So you may invest a lot of time and energy and feel like, gee, you know, the person we had here wasn't so bad. <laughs> so sometimes people invest in people who are younger. 
Um, lots of times it's middle manager and above, but sometimes it's even younger than that. And then there are the people who hire coaches for everyone at a certain level because they believe that we want all of our talented people to learn certain things. Sometimes it's about culture, about how to develop a, uh, a relationship of trust and respect in the workplace. Sometimes it's a question about um, learning about the way we, we do things, teaching them norms about how we plan, how we execute, how we work with customers. So this, this oftentimes coaches are hired for an entire level of people in an organization or to, do, or to do different things that the organization wants to happen across the board. So coaches have formal titles both in business and industry and nonprofit world as well as with sports teams. But I think that there are times in all our lives where we find ourselves coaching someone else, even without the title. And why that's important is because you're listening to the Emotion Roadmap. Take the wheel and control how you feel. And this is Chuck Wolf. And I'm here with you today, and I'm really pleased to be here. Um, you know, it's, it's always a pleasure to engage with the WPKN community. And my chances to do that are on Wednesdays, the first and second Wednesdays of each month from 12 to 1 p.m. So I'll be here next week and this week. And if you have something you want to call in about, I want to show you how the Emotion Roadmap can be influential in any situation where you're trying to coach another person to change in some way, to grow in some way. You know, it's funny. Sometimes you think about coaching and uh, you're trying to change a, a critical, um, you, you, someone's critical of a behavior that you want to help that person to change. And so if you're talking about something where you're being critical of, of another person, it's automatic, automatic that there'll be some defensiveness. It's just part of our evolutionary system. It was Charles Darwin that first noticed that emotions are not haphazard. They're not random. They're, they provide a source of data. It's kind of like, for those of you who understand information systems in organizations, it's like an information system inside human beings is our emotional awareness. Our emotions are often guiding and telling us something important. Now, my emotion roadmap was conceived as part of this whole science of emotional intelligence. And in looking and working with people, in, the, in trying to help individuals and organizations and leaders be more emotionally intelligent, one of the things that I discovered is that oftentimes our emotions will tell us something. And certainly being aware of our emotions is really helpful, but then it doesn't need to stop at just being aware. And this is the key. This is so important for anybody who's listening that has an interest in this. It's the idea that we have more control over our emotions than we might think. So when we realize that an emotion that we're feeling it isn't helpful. It's not something that is useful to us at this point. It was helpful to let us know that this is a scary situation and we should feel fear. But if the fear lingers even past that when the situation no longer seems to exist in the same way, that's not helpful. If we're angry and it's not a time that we can do something with that angry, that angry, angry feeling, then we, we need to figure out. So how do we kind of push the anger into a place inside of us where we can act on it at a later point because the mo at the moment, it's not useful. There's lots of times where emotions, again, are interesting and informative and important for us to pay attention to. And there are also times when once we realize what we're feeling and we, we make ourselves conscious of this, we can ask ourselves, instead of what we're feeling, would there be something else that would be even more ideal? And that's part of what I learned when I got really involved with the pioneers in emotional intelligence. I learned that we can change our emotions and that we shouldn't just randomly pick a different emotion, like I want to be happy all the time. No, but instead we should think about what emotion is going to be most useful for what we're trying to get done. And sometimes happy is the best choice, and sometimes it's being you know, angry. Sometimes it's being... Um, Sometimes it's being assertive or aggressive. Uh, well, there are times when we need to think about what emotion is really going to work to support what we're trying to get done. And we can plan to create that emotion in ourselves and also in influencing others. 
And, the, and as coaches, when we're trying to help somebody to learn something, we really have to be aware often of how someone is feeling. Because I'm sure if you've tried to help someone and you're trying to explain something to someone to, to do something differently, sometimes what do you see typically? You see people get frustrated because they don't understand what you mean. Or they try it and they watched you do it and you did it perfectly as a model, but they go to do it and they fail at it. Even though they watched you as close as they could and they try to understand as best they could and they're frustrated. Or sometimes you get to say, geez, I, I, just, I just went out with you on that call to visit the customer and, um, and here's the things I thought went really well and here's a couple of things that I would do differently and here's why. And as soon as you say, I would do differently, and here's why, you have to know right away that emotionally they're going to be defensive. So when you're coaching someone, how do you take into account the role of emotions? And the emotion roadmap works like this. The emotion roadmap is all about helping you to first think about a situation that's confounding you, that's causing you to have some doubt, you're uncertain how to move forward, and you just can't seem to take a next step. And it's troubling. It's bothersome. It's important to you. Well, what I do with the emotion robot is I ask you, tell me a bit about the situation. And once I understand it, tell me how you're feeling. What is it you're feeling best you can describe? And then if there's others who are key to what you're trying to do, how is he or she or they feeling? And then we talk about, well, if that's what everybody's feeling that's important to this, what could we do? to create more ideal feelings. And what would those ideal feelings be? So that's the idea of a roadmap. How do we get you, and my favorite example is to, from feeling anxious to feeling confident. Because that's one that troubles many people. Uh, another one that is one I hope you never experience, but you might have already, and you may sometime in the future, um, where you feel like you were trusting someone and they betrayed you. When I think about emotion roadmap, I think about the longest journey any of us can take is to try to get back to trusting somebody that we really, really trusted at a very deep level and they betrayed us. So my name is Chuck Wolf. You're listening to the Emotion Roadmap. Take the wheel and control how you feel. The subject today is coaches and emotions. And if you're trying to coach somebody, if you've got some ideas about coaching somebody and the emotions involved with coaching somebody successfully, or if you're stuck and you haven't been able to successfully coach somebody, give me a call. And the number to call is 203-336-9756. 203-336-9756. So uh, those of you who might be professional coaches out there, either as an executive coach, or a leadership coach, a life coach, a career coach, um, there's many different titles out there, peer coach. If you're doing some coaching and you've got some insights into this world of emotions and coaching, give me a call. Love to hear from you. 203-336-9756. If you're someone who isn't a professional coach, but you're trying to influence someone that you might consider that you're trying to coach, then give me a call and let's see if we can use the emotion roadmap to help educate everybody. Cause when you call, and I'm able to use the emotion roadmap to help you. Everybody's learning about how the emotion roadmap works. And to me, it's a life-changing skill. So if you're tuning in for the first time, um, I can tell you that there's many of my shows, if you like what I'm saying and you're interested, that you can listen to now on SoundCloud, which is wonderful, or iTunes, or Stitcher. Um, we've had our talk shows on these different podcasts and you can go in and just go to WPKN click on podcast and you can see a whole bunch of different WPKN shows. If you're looking for mine, it's called the emotion roadmap with Chuck Wolf. The tagline for the show is take the wheel and control how you feel. So again, if you got somebody you're trying to influence and you've got a plan and you're just thinking, well, Maybe I'll run it by this this guy on, on the radio on WPKN. Uh, good to hear from you. Here's my first phone call. Hi, this is Chuck Wolf. You're on the air. Who am I talking to? Good morning, Chuck. My name is Joni. Hi, Joni. Um, I'm trying to coach a friend of mine who has 
invited me to stay temporarily in her home. She's given me a room with my three cats. And because I'm in between places of residence. However, I can't convince her that it's very important that she locks her door. She's in the habit of keeping her door unlocked when she's out of her home and only locks it when she's in at night. She fears that she feels that she doesn't have anything worthy of stealing. Um, She lives in an area of our town, which is, I would not say um, bad, but it's had some problems with crime. Um, I can't convince her that for our own personal safety, that locking the doors nowadays is essential. She's a senior citizen, as I am, and should really have much more common sense. But I don't know how to convince her. It yeah, okay, so let me let me just uh, kind of play this all back. So you're trying to convince her uh, that there's a safety issue, and because you're concerned about safety, um, this isn't just theoretical. I mean, this is important because you're living there at the moment. So for your own safety, you're concerned, but also you just think it's just wrong in her in in the way she thinks about it is to um, leave the door open. Uh, leave the door open when she goes out. And it is kind of curious, and and I'm sure, at least in in my mind, listening to you, I'm guessing you're feeling right now frustrated. Does that sound right? Uh, I'm frustrated, Um, and as you you well know, when you move from a place that is your, your own and your belongings are going to be stored in other places and you're moving to a new place, um, that you have feelings of anxiety. Okay. To begin with. Great. Okay. So you've identified um, the anxiety too. Okay. Yeah, and it's an ongoing thing because it's it's a process uh, of, of packing and unpacking and being unsuccessful in trying to find the place that I want to live in, which would be a guarded kind of community. But I'm on a waiting list, and it may be another year or two. Wow. So my concern is that. Um, I do not interfere with her lifestyle. However, the part of her lifestyle that I cannot understand is that she feels safe uh, and the, all of her possessions, uh, uh, but leaving them uh, in, a, in a house that is unlocked. Hmm. So the qu- it looks it's a, even an invitation to an intruder because it's not even an indoor it's a uh, outdoor um, a screen door with a glass insert so it looks as though somebody um, doesn't even care hmm. from the outside. So there's a couple things that are in play here. One is, she's lived there for a long time doing it this way? Um, almost 30 years. Yeah, so that's... And the neighborhood has changed since she moved there 30 years ago. So she's unwilling to change her behaviors um, that have been working for her for a long time. Yes, she just... That's her attitude. Um, it's... It, uh, I wish we all could ha- live with our doors unopened. At one time, we did. But uh, it's obvious now that um, it, it's just a silly thing to do and an unnecessary, um, unnecessary worry on my part. And she doesn't understand my feelings, and I can't understand why she doesn't. That sounds complex. I know. No, no, it sounds it sounds pretty straightforward. I mean, I, I mean, I think most people listening, honestly, Joni would would feel like you. Like, why would anybody not lock their doors in today's world? 
Why, why does that make sense to anyone? It was a different time many years ago, maybe when she moved there, that everybody was neighborly and everybody sort of knew each other's names in the neighborhood. And, and maybe people just felt so friendly that they didn't mind if anybody walked in and needed something and walked into their homes. And people were just more, much, much more trusting than in the past. And yet, over the over the years, I think many people are more on the same page you are where you're feeling like, how can anybody live today without locking the door when they go out? And then, of course, your belongings are in this place, so now you're worried that your 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 things um, might... Not, no, I'm, I'm only going to have room for my bed, um, some boxes to put some personal belongings in. Um, I can't have television because she doesn't have cable. Uh huh. But the, my the most important thing to me is the unit that I have on almost twenty four hours a day, which is WPKN. <laughs> um, without that, I would be lost. That's my only. That will be my only comfort zone is being in my room and listening to uh, this fabulous station, which I have done for years. <laughs> Thank you so much for that, Johnny. I don't want nice anyone. To, I don't want anyone <laughs> to come in and and take my bows. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so that, that you know the the, uh, the idea of at least some some piece of equipment. You're worried a bit about somebody taking that. Here, here's a couple of things. That I guess you you want to think about as I'm thinking about them as I'm listening to you, trying to be helpful. So one is the question is let's understand what everybody's feeling. What do you think she's feeling when she walks out the door that causes her to do this. Do you have any idea about what she might be feeling? Why she feels um, easy about not locking the door? Yeah. Uh, My only guess is that she just doesn't have any fear. So she feels safe doing it, I guess, right? I mean, the opposite she of hip- yeah. She she she'll go and take a walk late at night alone in this neighborhood mm-hmm. and leave the door unlocked behind her. Mm-hmm. And if she takes these midnight walks, I would be upstairs alone, listening to the radio and hoping <laughs> no one comes in. You know what? I, yeah. So, uh, so let, let me let me take a shot at what I think's happening with her. I mean, again, this is you know I'm just listening to you and I don't know her, but um, the the let me tell you a little story. I, there's there's an exercise I do sometimes when I'm I'm working with a group of people to understand how they experience trust. And what I do is I ask people to think about if you were in a situation where you were going to have to work with somebody, maybe as a volunteer or, or as a worker in a where you currently might be working or someplace you've worked in the past and you knew you were going to be meeting a new person today that was going to be working alongside you or with you or maybe for you or it doesn't matter but just somebody you were going to be working closely with how would you start with them in terms of trusting them would you start with them as if you couldn't trust them at all at a zero in other words no trust until you give me great evidence that you are someone worth trusting and the other choice, the more extreme choice on the other side, is that you're at a 10, whereas unless there's really, really obvious reasons I shouldn't trust you, I'm going to totally trust you with everything and anything. And, of course, most people are not on exactly either end of that, but they fall somewhere in between when I ask them to, to, to pick a number where you fall in this continuum of zero, no trust, to 10, total trust. And most people are somewhere along that continuum. And so as I think about what you're telling me about the woman who has allowed you to live in with them, one is because they're very trusting, apparently. Um, They've allowed you to move in with them, and they're not worried about that. And they, for 30 years, haven't. this person has not been worried about walking in their neighborhood and um, leaving their door open because they choose to live that way. And what I mean by choose is that I don't think there's an answer about what's the right number for whether you should or shouldn't trust a person. I think it's based a lot on what people have experienced in their lifetime. 
starting with their immediate family who raised them, whether they could trust their parents or single parent or aunt or grandmother, whoever might have raised them, whether they could trust their neighborhood, the people in the neighborhood, people that were close friends, teachers, mentors, whatever. Um, And somewhere people make some decisions about how they want to live their lives. And your experience is somewhere where, not that you may not, I mean, you might be at a six or a seven on trusting people, I don't know, um, but she's at a eight or nine. And you might be more at a three or four. I, I really don't know. But just listening to you and trying to help you think this through is, it might be that she's, I mean, obviously, if she's smart at all, she knows that the world has changed. It's not like you're, you you can say that to her and, and have her not, you know, feel like, well, that's not new information. I've known that for a long time that the neighborhood's changed. I mean, yeah, unless you think I'm stupid, I, I, of course I know that. But I'm just choosing to live my life that way because that's how I want to live. And if something happens, if something really unfortunate happens, I guess I'll deal with it, but... Until something unfortunate happens, or even if something unfortunate happens, I just want to choose to live this way as if I can trust people in the world. And you may just have to accept that if you're going to live in her home. I mean, so part of this is I know you want me to help you change her, but it may be that what needs to happen is if you're going to be in this home, that you understand that you and she are very different in your choices about this, but it is her home, and if you're going to be there, you're going to have to just be more accepting. I know that may not be what you want to hear, but I'm trying to help you understand what at least is happening. Does that make sense at all? It makes sense, yes. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying that I'm not leaving it as if you can't change it, but I just wanted you to understand that part of this might be that, um, so if I can change myself, then I need to be less fearful and more trusting that if something does happen, um, I mean, you told me worst case basis is, of course, and I'm not talking about harm to either one of you, of course, but worst case basis is somebody steals your bows and you can't listen to WPKN for a while. Um, and I, I appreciate that. But at the same time, I think that when you um, realize that, okay, I mean, it'd be horrible to lose that, um, but life goes on. And it's not, I mean, well, again, it's not what you want to have happen. And and you may not be able to stay there. I mean, this may not work for you if you can't accept what, what's, uh, um, what's going to be. I could, I could live without the bows. That could be replaced somehow or other in another form. I, I have an old transistor radio, but I don't think I'd pick up your signal down <laughs> here in Suffolk County <laughs> on an old-fashioned transistor. But... I fear more for my my own personal safety. I understand the safety of my three animals who will be thrust into a brand new situation. They're coming from a three room apartment into a house that is rather cluttered, to say the least. So they have an adjustment, and uh, it's it, those are. My personal belongings, the living personal belongings, which are my pets. Yeah, I understand. I'm not worried about material things. But, um, so let me ask not, you. Have not you, the least. I, so, I mean, that, and that makes... My that, radio, yes, but I could sit in the car. And <laughs> okay. So the, the, next, the next question for you, Johnny, is, so have you, what are you thinking about saying to her to make her realize how important all these issues are? And my guess is you've already talked somewhat about this with her, or maybe you haven't yet. Um, but if you have or haven't, what's happened so far? Or what are you thinking about doing? I'm going to ask her why she feels comfortable leaving the door unlocked. Um, we aren't far from the towns of Central Islip and Brentwood. It's about 15 miles, and as you understand, with some unfortunate things that have happened there recently, as far as the MS-13 gang is concerned, mm-hmm. um, and where her home is located is predominantly Ecuadorian families. Uh-huh. Um, they've been there for a long time. Uh-huh. They work hard. Yeah. Um, 
our town has always been ethnically mixed from as far back as the 20s because of the big mill that thrived here and brought lots of people in from New York. So it has a history of diversity, which is part of its charm. However, um, it seems to be that this this group uh-huh. from L.A. and El Salvador, um, their target group it seems to be people who are, are Latin, if I'm not mistaken. I'm not... Uh, I haven't been following the news in much detail because I've been too exhausted to at night to tune in um, um, what's going on in, in, in that matter. Well, let, let me let me stop you here just for a moment because one of the things I want to ask you is um, certainly there are reasons even with without the gangs, but you know in any neighborhood, most many people feel like they should be locking their doors. So you're certainly not alone in that. But if you accept what I said, asking her why she chooses this, she may or may not be able to, you know, be clear in in articulating what she feels. But my guess is it, that's she's going to say that's just how I want to live. At which point, that's not going to be helpful to you, I don't think. No. Because you're not going to. I mean, you can't really argue with that. The one thing that might help her to change, if I, you open to a possible other idea, different way. Of course. So one thing that you might consider is um, saying that, um, I, you know, it's curious to me how you cho- why you choose not to lock your door, um, but it is your home, and I, and, and I certainly respect that. But I wonder if you would also respect how I'm feeling about worried that even inadvertently someone might open the door and my pets might get out and they might be lost. And I wonder if you wouldn't mind for the time that I'm here if we could change that behavior, not because I want you to change the way you think or the way you feel or the way you behave or the way you live, but simply if you would just understand my concern and fear for the things that I love, that somehow they might be lost, even accidentally, without going into all the fear factors that she, I'm sure, deals with but tries to not even think about. Mm -hmm. So if you change the conversation to be more about protecting what you love you may have a better better shot because then she's likely to feel more supportive at least consider changing her behavior not because she's changing her lifestyle or changing the way she thinks or what she believes because i don't think you can get her to do that not after all these years um, and what she continues to do, which sounds a bit irrational to me, but nevertheless, that's her choice and what she's what she's doing. Um, and it's her home, of course. But if you position it that way, I think you might have a better chance of her saying, you know what, during the time that you're here, um, I'm willing to do that. And then you don't have to argue about whether you're right or wrong about the way she thinks and believes. No, uh, arguing is out of the question. Um, I would face... Uh eviction <laughs> yeah exactly yeah yeah well she's been so lovely to let you stay there i don't i don't know that she you know if, if i mean it depends on the level of argument of course but i just know that when people's beliefs are challenged and 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 when you sh- that's why i try to explain the thing about trust sometimes people know that they're likely to have their trust broken but even so they want to live at a high trust level because that's the way they want the world to be. And they hope by their living that way that the world will move in that direction, even though it might cost them in some meaningful way at some point. And they just choose that. So I don't, that, those are hard things to change. And I don't know that you even want to change them because it's quite lovely at some level. But I also think that you have a real fear for things that, and again, if you, if you were arguing about the bows, I don't know that you can make the, the sale, if you will. You couldn't, make, you couldn't influence the behavior. You couldn't, you couldn't coach them to, to change the way they behave because a bows is just a, a, a material thing. But the things you love and worried that even somebody who wasn't, wasn't an MS-13 gang member, but just somebody might open the door and your pets might, might be lost. That would be traumatic, and that's why you're asking. Would you, if you, if you're not, if you don't mind, I would really appreciate at least during the time I'm here, and I'm really thankful that you're allowing me to be here and so forth. But um, just so because I care so much about my pets, I think that has a chance to make her feel the way you want. 
Well, I thank you, and I, I shall pursue this. And um, I've also, I've taken up a lot of your time. It's 1230. Yeah, well, you know what? It's always a pleasure to talk with anyone who's got something. And, and you know, I'm hoping I helped you, Joni. You know, maybe maybe this is enough to get her to, um, to you know, to make that change. And, uh, you know, it's... Um, it, it, I don't think it causes any argument. I just think, I mean, even if she doesn't say yes right away, I think it's something that she'll think about. You'll cause her to think deeply. And you're, what you're hoping is to change her feelings and not change her beliefs, but change her feelings about keeping the door locked, at least during the time you're there. Very good. Okay. You, you've, you've given me some words to use, at least. <laughs> okay. <laughs> A pleasure. Come up with it. Thank you so much, Chuck. You betcha. Take care, and thanks for listening to WPKN. <laughs> I won't stop. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Bye-bye. Goodbye. So um, this this whole idea of emotions and coaching is like, you got to understand you know, how people are feeling and why they're feeling the way they feel, and if you want them to feel something different, you got to think about, well, what might make them feel different? That's why I thought Joni's conversation about um, safety and the gangs, etc. Um, you know, the woman's op- unless you know this, unless there's dementia or something. For the most part, she's going to know those things already. But she may not have thought about how Joni's feeling about her pets and about the fact that even a neighbor might open the door and the pets might escape. So uh, uh, that's the idea of an emotion roadmap and coaches and emotion. So if you've got a reason to call and you'd like to talk with me, the number again is 203-336-9756. And you're listening to WPKN which um, operates out of Bridgeport. We serve Fairfield, New Haven, and Litchfield counties in Connecticut. And as we are just talking to Joni, and we also serve Suffolk County in New York, as well as communities around the world via podcast and streaming at wpkn.org. And as I mentioned before, if you want to listen to the show past shows, um, you can listen to them on SoundCloud. Uh, that's the that's preferred for me. But if you have iTunes and you like iTunes, you can listen to us on iTunes. Um, the best way to get there is to get to WPKN.org. You go to the um, the website, click on pod, podcast, pick the uh, particular um, application that you want to use, whether it's iTunes, SoundCloud, or Stitcher, and then search for the Emotion Roadmap with Chuck Wolf. And um, hopefully you find me. Also, you can listen to some of my favorite shows. I put on something called Public Radio Exchange. That's P as in public, radio, R, and for exchange, X, P-R-X dot org. And you can type in the Emotion Roadmap and a whole bunch of my uh, past shows come up as well. So again, you're listening to the Emotion Roadmap. I'm Chuck Wolf, And the tagline is take the wheel and control how you feel. And I wanted to have the topic about coaches and emotions. So I will give you a chance to call again, and um, if if I don't get a call in the moment, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Celtics, um, what, what just transpired last night in a pretty incredible game. I'll tell you that story if we don't get out of the calls. So the next caller, if you want, which is more fun, really, it's uh, always fun to have a caller, is the number is 203-336-9756. And if there's anybody out there that does coaching for a living, again, there's all kinds of coaches out there. There's career coaches, there's life coaches, there's peer coaches, there's executive coaches, there's leadership coaches, and then there are sports coaches. And you don't have to be a professional sport. You don't have to be the coach of the Boston Celtics. You can be a coach of um, your child's little league team or your um, daughter's uh, soccer team. or doesn't matter. Hi, this is Chuck. You're on the air. Oh, can you turn your radio down? Oh, shit. My bad. Oh, no no swearing. I'm sorry. Can't, you can't do that. <laughs> uh, can you turn your, your sound down? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Well, there goes that phone call. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, anybody else? Yeah, somebody that wants to call in? Again, the number is 203-336-9756. And again, you're welcome to call back. I, you just um, 
because of um, rules that govern the earwaves. We can't have anybody that swears, even inadvertently, or even when you get mad at something that just happened. Uh, okay, again, 203-336-9756. Okay, um, let me tell you a little bit about uh, what's was happening last night. So, for those of you that don't follow professional sports, I... I I, I don't I mean I don't know where you grew up and whether it was part of your growing up experience or your culture, but I grew up in um, a place in Massachusetts, about twenty miles southwest of Boston. And if you're from Massachusetts, uh, it's pretty clear that you're from at least almost everybody I knew growing up was a fan of the Red Sox, of the Bruins, of the Celtics, and of the Patriots in later years. Now. When I say a sports fan, it's like an avid thing. I mean, just People just really live and die by this stuff, at least many of the people I grew up with. But the, the reason I want to talk about the Celtics isn't so much about a professional sports team or a Boston sports team. But what I want to talk about is this young, younger man, Isaiah Thomas, who plays for the Boston Celtics, who has had a really wonderful couple of years there. He's a very um, small person by NBA standards, under six feet, you know, the exact height I'm not sure of, but somewhere between 5'7", 5'9". And yet he is able to perform in amazing ways. Uh, You know, if if you understand when a team plays against another team and you have a a star uh, on the team you're playing against, you, you tend to cover them with your best defender. Sometimes you put two defenders on them just to keep them from scoring. Well, they can put two or three defenders on this young man, and he still manages to score, which is great. But every every team has their stars who can score and defend and so forth. So that's not so unusual. What's unusual about Isaiah Thomas is that this year the Celtics had won quite a few games in their conference as an Eastern Conference and a Western Conference, and they came out the number one seed, which means they had the best record of any other team. And they have three series of playoffs um, in the conference. Um, So they play one series, and if they get past that series, they play a second series, and then they play for the championship of the conference. And then if they win their conference, they play against the winner of the Western Conference, and that's how you get an NBA championship. Well, what happened with Isaiah Thomas was that he, the, the team was about to begin their playoffs against the Chicago Bulls. And the Chicago Bulls were the, the lowest seed, and they were not supposed to be that good. But they, they actually have three really great players. And somebody's calling, so you'll have to listen later. Hi, this is Chuck. You're on the air. Uh, who am I talking to? Hello? Hi, can you turn your radio down? Hello? Hi. Is there somebody on the um, line? Yes, I'm, I'm talking to you. Can you turn the radio down? Yeah, we, we you said call the radio, and we just wanted to call. <laughs> okay. Did you want to call? Uh, so what's, up, what's up with this nigga named Donald Trump? <laughs> oh, okay, so you just want to just have some fun? That's why you're calling? Yeah, that's the phone. What's good with this nigga Donald Trump? Yeah, okay. Well, we can't really have people calling in that aren't serious. This is a show about trying to help people. So I'm sorry you called, and I'm sorry I can't help you have fun. We find another way today. Thanks for your call. Bye-bye. Okay, well, you know, there's people that, um, I guess, they're just looking for something to do. But anyway, um, let me finish the story then. So the idea of what was happening in this in this young man's life is that he was about to start a series. And again, he's the focal point for the Celtics, and he's one of the best players. And his sister, his youngest sister, is killed in a car accident the day before the series is to start, or like one or two days before. So the reason I'm talking about this particular individual is because Think about the emotions of a loss of a loved one and also being the star player of a team that depends on you um, in a series that's about to start that you spent an entire year trying to get ready for and hopefully go pretty deep and maybe even win a championship. So what goes on inside a person when they experience a tremendous loss at the same time they're on the verge of possible greatness in in a championship, at least the beginnings of that journey, 
and they have to compete the next day or two. And how about all the people surrounding him when they all care about this guy because he's a well-liked, well-respected, um, beloved person and figure in Boston at this point. And everybody cares about him. And at the same time, they're caring about him. He's suffering an enormous loss. So I think everybody, there's something called emotional contagion. And everybody felt this, this sadness in him because of the experience of what just happened. So Boston plays their first two games at home, which is usually an advantage. And he actually plays really well, but a lot of the team struggles. And they lose the first two games. Now, the series is um, best of seven. So if you win four in a row, it's over. If you, it's three and three at the end, you play the seventh game, and whoever wins that one wins. But you just have to get to four games. After this, the, the, the second game um, happens, he plays a game in Chicago. And it seems like some something turns around. He Somehow he plays a really, really good game. And something changed. Now, part of it was one of their Chicago's players wasn't playing anymore, so it made it a little easier. Certainly made it easier because a key player for Chicago got hurt. But things started to turn around. But during the turnaround, he also had to go to the funeral of his sister. And then the day before the game that was going to start the new series, after they beat Chicago, they actually came back and won three games in a row, or four games in a row to beat Chicago, because somehow emotionally he got control, and so did everybody else on the team, it seemed. And they got better and better. And then they came out and played a great game against this Washington team. But in playing a great game, they he had to come back from a funeral the day before for his sister, fly out to Washington State. Not not the Washington team is the Wizards, and they play out of D.C. on the East Coast. But his sister got, um, she was killed in an accident on the West Coast, on the state of Washington. And so emotionally, just enormous upheaval. And then he... The next thing that happened is they win that first game and, and then his sister's birthday happens and he has to play again. And the, the game, the game before where they, where they won, he has a tooth knocked out and he has to sit. So he has, he's dealing with his sister's death and then the birthday her so, you know, the, the day she was born is the same day that they play the second game in Boston. And he also had a tooth knocked out and he had to sit in the dentist chair for a couple hours while they were doing dental surgery, I guess. And then he comes out. And the reason I'm telling you the story is because I, I watched the game last night and he scored 53 points, which is absolutely phenomenal in a game that Washington probably should have won because they were winning the whole game until the very end. And then this young man scores like 29 points between the last quarter of the game is four quarters and the fourth quarter. And then it went to overtime and that's five minutes. And then in that period of time, he scored 29 points. Unbelievable performance given the emotional circumstance. So my point is when I talk about coaching and emotions, how do you deal with emotions in a way that allows you to grieve and experience fully and at the same time set aside and perform at a high level. In terms of what I write about in the chapter, if you were listening earlier when I first started talking, um, I'm going to write about coaches and emotions. And, you know, what you want to help people with when you're trying to help them at least improve performance is to understand all the emotional circumstance surrounding them that's holding them back. What are the obstacles that keep people from doing their best? And how do you exemplify the way that you deal with tremendously powerful, negative emotional experience and at the same time perform at a high level? Because a lot of us don't love where we work. A lot of us don't love the person who we report to or some of the people that we have to deal with on a regular basis. And yet all of us, I believe all of us, would like to be seen as a high performer, someone capable of reaching and maybe even surpassing what people see as our potential. How do you do that?
And one of the ways, I think, is that you focus on this idea of emotions and an emotion roadmap and the idea of how do I, I understand how I am feeling. And if that feeling can help, and at least that's the way I saw what Isaiah Thomas did. He said, I want to be great for my sister. It was her birthday today, and whether my tooth was knocked out and put back in, and I had surgery on my face, and I'm wearing a mouth guard that's unusual, and I'm suffering the loss of this wonderful young woman that I adored, I'm still going to perform at an incredibly high level because my teammates are counting on me, and I want to do it for my sister. And somehow he leveraged that feeling in a way that created one of the all-time best Celtic performances ever. I said ever like my Massachusetts accents, I guess. Anyway, so the idea of emotions and the emotion roadmap are really all about helping you understand when you have a circumstance where you are troubled, uncertain, facing difficult, challenging circumstances, and you are feeling like you want to do better, but you're not sure how. I encourage you, each of you, to think about how can you take what you are feeling and either leverage that feeling in a positive way or change that feeling to some other feeling that would be more ideal for the circumstance or challenge or situation that you're facing and turn it into something where you're in control. You take the wheel and you control how you feel. Now, we just had the one call. We talked for a while, and I'm really glad. Thank you, Johnny, for calling, and I appreciate you making the call. Um, I have five minutes if anybody else wanted the call. We could do a quick one. The number is 203-336-9756. And I'll give you a minute if you wanted the call. So I don't have any other callers. So let me say a couple things um, that I wanted to say about just coaching and emotions. I assume that all of you at some point are going to be asked for advice. And when you get asked for advice, it's sometimes real and sometimes not. Let me explain what I mean. For those of you who are listening earlier in the show and you heard me um, talking with Joni about a situation she was facing, I don't know if you caught it, but I asked her, so I'm assuming, Joni, that you talked to this woman that you're living with now about your concerns, or if you haven't talked to her, you're thinking about talking to her and you're wondering what's the best way to do that. And I don't know about you folks, but my initial reaction, because I th- see myself as a really good problem solver, is when somebody has a problem, I want to solve it. And I, I assume that many of you do as well. And so when you're trying to coach somebody, it's because you see them experiencing a problem. Now, one thing is you have to make sure that they see it as a problem before you start coaching, um, or you help them to see it as a problem. But the other thing is you want to think about is if they have a problem, Chances are they've been thinking about it for a while and you just heard about it. So your initial thought, they may have already considered and dismissed. So if I offer something that seems just so obvious to me about, hey, what about this? Why wouldn't you tell her this? Or, I mean, for example, I could have said to Joni, you know, maybe you should share police reports in the neighborhood. Show trends. Show, show, show a, a graph that showed trends, uh, you know, with crime increasing in the neighborhood since this gang of MS-13 people have arrived and, and tried to scare her by showing her data, thinking that data was the way that you change feelings. But I remember working at Exxon many years ago and a person who was really a smart fellow who was in charge of their organizational development practice. And I was working in that world at that time. And we came to him and said, we got all this data that supports doing things differently. And we shared the data with him. He said to him, he said to us, he said, he told me, he said, Chuck, you know, data is important, but it's never enough by itself. You have to pay attention to how people are feeling and why. And that's what I encourage you all to think about. If you're trying to change somebody's behavior and you're thinking about how to help them and you want to change how they feel, before you offer your solution, ask them, how come you're feeling that way? And once you understand it, try to find a way to help them to feel the way you want them to feel and offer advice by suggesting that, hey, I have a different way of thinking about it. Would you be interested? Because I think maybe if you did it that way, Maybe it would work, but here's some concerns I would have with it. But here's another choice if you want to hear it. And when you ask permission and they give you that permission, then you got a chance, a real chance of helping them. 
And so let me leave you with that, folks. You know, anytime somebody asks you for, you know, for help with something, listen to them. Ask them what they've already tried. Ask them what they're thinking about. And if they don't really have a good plan and it's pretty clear to them and to you, and you think you have something, ask for permission and it will go so much better for you. This is Chuck Wolf. You've been listening to the Emotion Roadmap. Take the wheel and control how you feel. I'll be back with you next week. Joni, thank you so much for the phone call. I'm glad that you love to listen to WPKN. I hope everybody out there does. And uh, I'll be back. And the show is the Emotion Roadmap. Take the wheel and control how you feel. We are WPKN 89.5 FM in Bridgeport, serving Fairfield, New Haven, and Litchfield counties in Connecticut and Suffolk County in New York, as well as communities around the world via podcast and streaming at WPKN.org. Thank you so much, everybody. Take care now. Funding for Simsbury Community Television is provided in part by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.